Welcome to uh, Mission Valley Community Chapel. We'll start with a moment of silent prayer, parallel <coughs> service. First hymn is 89, hymn 89, oh should I speak the matchless word. Seated, and our next hymn is 401, 401, Wake My Soul in Joyful Lays.
announcements from Tom. Good morning. You know, Clint, Clint called me last night and said he wouldn't be able to make announcements because this long-awaited um, appointment he's been working on for years to arrange yeah. <laughs> finally happened today. So next week you can ask him to show you his pedicured glittered toenails <laughs> between you and us so that that's the joke for next week for him so ask him how that went <laughs> but really I'm nervous about trying to match his humor that's the best I can do <laughs> so on to business um, today's June 23rd uh, welcome to the chapel what a wonderful place to be uh, we've got uh, so I going to give the word later today We've got a Monday uh, craft night. Crafty ladies are at work. We have a prayer meeting on Wednesday, at 7 p.m. here over at Mayor Hall. Uh, next Saturday, I don't think we've got anything on the Good News Club uh, for the rest of the summer, so we can axe that. But the good news, the uh, CEF is doing a bang up job at the fair in terms of the sort of a castle. So uh, I don't know if you have any slots still open, Don, for. Uh, There's, uh, I think one day, where's that was uh, an afternoon. There's one afternoon, I think. That's the one afternoon. afternoon. And the highest bidder gets it, right? I mean, that's yeah, the yeah, way yeah. it works. There, there, there are two evenings that need, uh, that need help. And that's in July. July 4th and the 5th or the 6th. Okay. I think it comes to the free hot dog on July 4th, right? That's part of the, <laughs> part of the deal. <laughs> Maybe a snow cone. Um, <laughs> next week, Tom's going to going to preach to us, for us. So our prayer focus is, as always, our, our government. You know, we vote these people in. We, we trust that they carry our values. That doesn't always work out. But we, we can't stop praying and hoping that that's the case. If they are, they are focused on, on a higher power than they think themselves of themselves. So uh, that's a constant. That's the battle of the world we, we face decisions that are made that we don't have any control over. So we just pray to the, the, the big father to to ride herd on that. Uh, prayer, prayer for Israel, especially um, missionaries there and, and what the country's going through. Um, it, it's incredible uh, in terms of the, you know, the end times. I'm not an end time prophet, but um, it's difficult not to see what's going on in, in, in the promised land. Group grief for our, our sick, uh, Diane, Margie, Jolie, Sterling, Rachel, Judy, Roberta, Dan, Carson, and Debbie, uh, the cancer, um, the cancer patients, Jeanette, Tom, Mike, Don, Susan, and Lydia. Lydia, what's going on? Uh, anything to report? I don't want to embarrass you like Clint, so maybe I'll just was end, end it there. <laughs> it's, my surgery is Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. This coming Wednesday, the 26th. Let's pray for Lydia that she's calm and and the uh, medical people are are awake and have a good night's sleep. <laughs> also, we've got uh, you know Tom's prayer team. You know the the door knockers. I remember one summer working selling pots and pans in Arizona, New Mexico when I was 19. It's probably not the same, but it's like that going into a, a store and asking, are there any single women here that need you know, cutlery for their hope chest? Um, what a scary thing. And so I didn't have the Lord in my life to guide me, but these kids do. So we just are grateful to see what, they, what, what their ambitions will do. The doors that open, again, the, the percentages are low, but the Holy Spirit doesn't care. We're just there, we're just the conduit. We plant the seeds. And we're, we're, we're not discouraged, although it's easy to get discouraged. Um, so we pray for these kids that are pounding the pavement in all parts of the country for their summer. It'll, they'll have memories that they'll be able to tell stories about 50 years from now. So that's the good news. I've got some pots and pans stories that aren't really appropriate for a church, but uh, in a, in a, at a cocktail party, um, they work. So that's what these kids are. They're arming themselves with a bunch of stories for later in their life. To, inspire other young people. And then Tom's, uh, the Blitz is uh, the, uh, the uh, change book. Circulation starts in July. Yeah, we now. like to call the, the Blitz when we talk about London. 
<laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, can, you can see on the back side, that's right, start July 8th, completed mid August. You can see on the back side the map of London City, and the colors indicate the waves of distribution. So all the blues will be distributed at one time, and the yellows and so forth. So there's a, there's a, a study of the Greater city of London and where the Jewish populations are, and that's where the 378,000 books will be focused for distribution. As you can see in there, the books are being printed now in London for distribution. Online. Great. So when, when I see this, this is like I'm really going off off the record here, but when I see Tom devote his resources to this effort, it, it, the odds are really slow, but the fact that he's willing to, to spent a lot of money to make this work, that should be encouragement for us to do the same thing, to, to give our resources, whether it's, it's financial or time or talent or experience to others, that's what the Lord wants. He wants servants, and we want to be servants. And, and Tom, this, this is incredible what you've done with the, with the book, leveraging your story and having the resources to, to print and distribute this. This is historic. This is, I mean, for us to happen, have this happen in such a little chapel is incredible. God doesn't need much to compound our efforts, our sincere efforts. What else we got? Um, yeah, I mean, it was in this chapel um, back in the 70s when I stood in the back of the library. They made an announcement that Tom's going to start this laboratory with the children. And uh, I only had 100, I needed $130 to stand. Started, and it was in the back of this chapel by that box there that a widow lady came up to me and gave me $100 to start the company. And I told God, if you give me money, I'll use it for missions. So I'm just trying to keep the promise. But that, 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 that in itself is the testimony of you don't have much, you're not sure where it goes, but you know where your heart is. You know what God wants for his kingdom. And you just take a chance. And to see this, you know, Tom, is that, that was 50 years ago? 48. 48 years ago. So that should be a guide to every young person in here to know that, that, that what you do seems insignificant. Nobody's, nobody knows, but Tom's story here, a good example. Maybe you rub your hand on where that happened, you know, and you can get the same mojo. <laughs> that, no, that, that would be voodoo. We can't, we can't, go, we can't talk about, about talismans and such, but anyway. Next, birthdays. Today is... Stella's birthday. Stella's not here. She normally sits there. You can sing a birthday. Isaiah, Isaiah. none of the Willisons are here, so we don't care. You know, <laughs> we'll take care of them. <laughs> July 4th, Elizabeth Mears. You gonna be you gonna be here, Elizabeth? No. No? Should we, should we sing her birthday for you now? So you oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> covered everything. Oh, sorry. No, I just have a prayer request. Um, Kaylee, no, sorry. You know your daughters. They are, all the names begin with a C. So. And Carly. Candace and Carly went this morning up to Iowa to start a WANA camp. And it's the whole southwestern region that's meeting up in Iowa uh, for this week. So prayers for the people in charge, for the kids to be receptive to, you know, if they're already saved, that they'll make their walk stronger with God, and those that aren't, that they will see God, especially if you really need our kids to be strong in the Lord right now. They, there's so much evil out that's trying to draw them away, and I see it even with my kids, just in what they have to deal with in the world today. So it's been pretty, pretty tough. So we're really praying that and then the second one, um, mom should probably say it, but my brother Jim, when he was getting his kidney stone out a while ago, I guess they didn't get it, so they said they did. And so they have to go in tomorrow and get that out. And apparently it's not normal, it's you know, hard and tough, and so they can't use the normal equipment to break it. And so they have to do 
Okay. Yeah. And Scott. Uh, yeah, please pray for this guy, uh, Jerry, that uh, Adina and Lydia went to school with at uh, Christian High. So he's having brain surgery, I believe it's this week or next week. So pray for him. And also for Dan and I as we have our shift at the fair this evening, so at the CEF booth. Okay, and I think one thing I missed is Jeff brought his Hootenanny uh, gang today, so we're going to have more than just believers. We're going to have a hoedown. We're all, we're all believers. We're all believers. Well, today you're going to show us another side of your musical talents, and put it that way. So, what do I do next? Uh, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next. Uh, Kim is uh, 783783. How long has it been? so thankful that you do care for us Lord help us to be mindful of that that we would cast on you our every care for you care for us Lord we pray for our nation that's in dire need Lord that uh, repentance uh, would take place Lord revival Lord we pray for our leaders that they would seek your wisdom and the decisions that they make that they would be mindful that they must give an account to you uh, we pray, Lord, for persecuted around the world that they would re be, remain steadfast in the faith, Lord, and, and be a witness to those persecuting them that they might turn from darkness to light. Continue to be with our, our, our missionaries, Lord, especially for those in Israel during this time, that they would have an open door of witness to the lost. Uh, be with the Dickinsons, Simon Sabah, and others, Lord, that are seeking to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Continue, Lord, to be with our sick, that they might know your grace that's sufficient. Lord, that uh, you are there with them as they go through these trials. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for that comfort and that peace. We pray, Lord, for the Awana camp. Lord, for the, the leaders and also for the children, Lord, that they would be challenged to, to give their lives to you, Lord, and that you would use them, Father, to, to be a witness to many. Uh, we pray, Lord, for Lori's brother, Jim, for this kidney uh, procedure tomorrow. Lord, just guide and direct the doctors, give Jim peace. Uh, we also pray for Jerry with his uh, brain surgery, for Lydia with her uh, surgery coming up on Wednesday. And Lord, we just uh, thank you, Lord, 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Be with our college students, Lord, that they would be rooted and grounded in the truth and not be swayed by any false teaching, that they might be a witness to fellow students and to their professors as well. Continue, Lord, to be with our unsaved loved ones, that you would bring someone across their path to share with them the words of life, that they would be pricked in their hearts by the Holy Spirit to have a godly sorrow that works repentance and the salvation. Continue to undertake for the preparations of the uh, distribution of the book Changed in London, Lord, be with the summer blitzers and also for the uh, outreach on uh, weekends, Lord, in L.A., and Lord, be with those at the fair. We pray that you would prepare the hearts and souls of those coming in, that the uh, their souls would be like good ground that's been prepared to receive the seed of your word and that it would bring forth fruit. Continue to bless the broadcast going forth here from the chapel. It's Thomas and Rob. And pray that you continue to raise up uh, more locations for the CEF and more volunteers. And we just thank you, Lord, that we can be fellow laborers, Lord, with you as you seek to save the lost, Lord, that that you can use us to be a witness. Now help us, Lord, to be available and usable for you, and that you would draw us closer to you, we pray, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, may be seated. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, this morning we are going to focus on Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. I'm going to read you these verses. The Lord Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who is in the secret place will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. So now let us pray. Father God, thank you for the great, great privilege of being at your church and being blessed by all these beautiful music and now by your word. May you open your word and help us, Father, to learn from the lips of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, how to pray. Uh, and actually how not to pray and how to pray correctly. We commit our time into your hand. May your name be uh, glorified through our study. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I trust that God will speak to all of us in regard to the lessons of prayer that Jesus teaches in this passage. What we must know about prayer and what we must be committed to is that when the Bible teaches principles of prayer, God accepts us to be obedient. God wants us to pray. Whether or not we can fathom the deep mysteries of how it works, it's not the issue. Ours is not to, to reason, but to obey. Ours is to pray. And so we approach Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 8. We hear some teaching about prayer from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ that is very basic to this matter of being obedient in our prayer life. Now let me give you some background. He's speaking on the side of a hill in the land of Israel to the Jewish people. He is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He is speaking not only to his disciples, the handful of men who had committed themselves to his cause, but also he's speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes who represented the phony religious leaders of the nation and beyond them to the crowd, to the mob, the people gathered also with them. And he's pointing this whole sermon is to contrast the true spiritual life with the false standard of Pharisaic system of that time. Basically any human standard that falls short of the standard of God. And here in our passage, he tells them 
their religious life is inadequate. He picks three examples, three illustrations out of their religious life to show their failures in regard to their giving, in regard to praying and fasting, which are all religious activities. They were hypocritical in their giving, they were hypocritical in their fasting, and they were hypocritical in their praying, which was toward God, or at least supposed to be that way. So every dimension of their spiritual experience involved hypocrisy. And Jesus is pointing out that God's standard for his kingdom are the genuine standard of true piety, not the false standard of these Pharisees that were even just pretense. And so he tackles them on the matter of prayer in verses 5 through 8. And his idea is to strip them naked of any self-righteousness. Actually, that's his goal in the whole Sermon on the Mount, so that they are literally cast on the mercy of God, at which point he offers himself as the savior from their sin. Now I want to share with you several of the faults that can creep in into our prayer life based on the experience of the Hebrew people. I want to share basically how not to pray in, from the experience of the Hebrew people. Number one, their prayer became ritualized. Their prayer became ritualized. They were functioning their prayers only in terms of a ritual. The ritual approach to prayer replaced the reality of pouring out your heart before God. Now, let me just give you an idea. This is not uncommon in our day. We have all these ritualistic prayer life also in our time. Some, some of the believers come from backgrounds where prayers were ritualistic where you were part of, a, for example, a sequential liturgy, where at the right time, at the right moment, uh, you're supposed to say the right kind of prayer. And some of you may have been familiar with prayer books and things like that. Uh, and prayer uh, was a routine thing for some of us. So it's not uncommon even this ritualistic approach to prayer in our lives. But even evangelical who do not take, who do not like those kind of liturgical things have their own little rit rituals too. We have our routine of prayers that we present to God in the name of prayer here and there. Uh, so the question is this, that you know, are we pouring out our heart before God as our Heavenly Father or are we just going through the routine? We can all identify with prayer as a routine, prayer as a ritual, prayer as simply an exercise. For example, every day, if you were a Jew, in the morning and at night, you had to repeat the Shema. Now, the Shema comes from the Hebrew word meaning here to here, and the Shema is basically Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And they went from Deuteronomy 6, from verse 4 to 9, over to chapter 11, verses 13 to 21, over to the book of Numbers, chapter 15, 37 to 41. They took all those verses together, and they made this long prayer out of it. And the Jew had to pray it every morning and every night. Also, they had what was known as, uh, if I hope I pronounce it correctly in Hebrew, Shemone Esri. And the Shemone Esri was another formalized kind of prayer. The Shemone Esri basically means 18. It is embodied, uh, it embodied 18 <coughs> prayers for all different kind of purposes. And it became pretty much standard that they were uh, there was prayer at the third hour, the sixth hour, and the night hour, which correspond to 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. of our hour time system. So that when those hours came, everybody sort of prayed. So this was pretty much the routine. Prayer became a ritualized function. You just do it without your heart and your mind being in it. It ceased for the most part 
and for the most people to be a meaningful communion with God. Now, the second thing uh, that is a fault that crept into the Jewish prayer habit was the development of a special prayer for a special occasion. They had prayer for everything. I mean, it didn't matter what it was, they wrote a prayer for it, and when that thing happened, you prayed that prayer. They had prayer for light, they had prayer for darkness, they had prayer for fire, they had prayers for lightning, they had prayer when you receive good news, and they had prayer when you receive bad news. They had prayer when you got a new furniture. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure the original intention of the rabbi was to bring everything into presence of God, to make every part of life and every act of nature and every event in the world something that drew us to God. So intention was good, but instead, there became a total commitment to prescribe and pre-develop, pre-written set prayer. The third fault that I have already kind of mentioned it is that, uh, just to mention it again, uh, was that prayer developed into something you did it at certain times. And apart from those times, you just didn't do it. So prayer was not a way of life. Now, I believe that prayer is like breathing. In fact, if the best illustration, the best example for prayer life is breathing. There are certain times that you breathe. You don't say to yourself, okay, it's 12 o'clock, I'm going to breathe now. No. Uh, prayer for us, I mean, breathing is just a natural response to our environment, and prayer for a believer should be the same thing. Prayer is the constant inhale, exhale of communion with God that goes on in the life of a believer at all times. Not to pray is to hold your breath. But for them, prayer becomes something strictly set to certain hours. Prayer became, for the most of the people, a kind of a useless routine, a habit. I mean, nothing bad to have good habit when, uh, except that you got to have your heart and your mind in it. So it just became a useless routine with a meaning nowhere beyond some kind of a an early function. You know, the Muslim have this custom that very much it's the same and uh, they pray at certain hours and there's a story the commentator William Barclay tells about that that the Muslim was pursuing an enemy and he was, he was, uh, he drew his knife uh, out to kill his enemy and then the call to prayer came out of the minaret. <laughs> And right when he was going to stab his enemy, he stopped. He unrolled his prayer cloth, and they do that. They have what is called prayer rod or prayer mat. He knelt down and prayed through his prayer as fast as he could, and then rose up and went on killing his enemy. So <laughs> that is a very good illustration that prayer has absolutely no effect in the person's life. It was just basically a routine, just doing it out of habit without having your mind in it. Um, and on that, let me share with you, when I was uh, back in Iran, when I was a Muslim, uh, and I was not a believer, I remember, you know, I would do my prayer too. And after a while, I get tired of it, because it's just a set routine going day after day after day. And I make the story short. Somehow I got, uh, I got my hand on a copy of a Bible in Persia. And I started reading the book of Psalms. And I loved the Psalms, the freedom, the way that David would express his feelings toward God. And uh, so I said, I wish I could pray like this. Then I went to my religious teacher, you know, even before the revolution, uh, we had to take, it was compulsory in the high school to take courses on Islam. And it happened to be that my religious teacher in high school, I don't know if I ever shared that, some of you may know, happened to be the son-in-law of the late Ayatollah Khomeini. And so I went to him and, you know, honestly, I didn't mean anything. And I just asked him, is there any place in our prayer that you can say what's in your heart? 
and just don't repeat this thing over and over and over. And really, there isn't any place, but he just wanted to give me an answer, kind of get rid of me. So, okay, at such and such a place, you can say what you want to say. And what I would do, and I, later on when I talked about it, I said, well, you know, that was quite interesting thing. I wonder what God was thinking about me at that time. Uh, when I would come in my Muslim prayer to that section, I would open the book of the Bible to the book of Psalm, and I start reading the Psalms of David. I would say a Jewish prayer in the middle of a Muslim prayer. No, I don't know what God thought, what was going on at that time. Anyway, so a fourth fault that crept into the Jewish prayer pattern was that they decided it was spiritual to pray long prayers, long, long prayers. And you know, the Lord said in Mark chapter 12, verse 40, for pretense, they make long prayer. Now, you know, I want to make it clear, there is absolutely nothing wrong with a long prayer if it's a real prayer, if it's a communion with God. But there is something definitely wrong with a long prayer or a short prayer if it's just I'm trying to impress others. Whether long or short, doesn't matter. And the rabbi used to say, whenever a prayer is long, that prayer is heard. So the implication, the idea was that you got to spend the first few minutes just getting God's uh, attention and getting God ready to hear what you wanted to say. And that leads to the fifth fault in their prayer, a tendency to pick up vain repetition uh, from the pagans. You know, the pagan approach to prayer is to keep repeating yourself until the God gets so tired and weary of hearing you that uh, he does what you want. That basically uh, is the idea. Just keep doing it and doing it and saying it and saying it until God gets so sick of hearing it that he finally reacts. And that's completely wrong. In fact, if you remember, Back in the Old Testament, in the encounter between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, uh, Elijah really gave them a bad time, hard time. He told them, uh, maybe your God is on vacation. Maybe he can hear you. Uh, better yell a little louder. He might be asleep. Wake him up. And they were going on and on. You know, they, they prayed all day long, and they kept saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Hour after hour after hour, they mumbled the same phrase, trying to wake up their God, trying to intimidate him into doing something for them. But the worst of all, the worst fault, and the final one to mention, is that they prayed to be seen by men, not to be heard by God. Believe me, if there is a pride in the human heart, uh, the system of prayer would really feed it, feed that pride. That kind of a system would feed the spiritual pride so readily. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, they love to pray. Now, at the first glance, that's wonderful, wonderful. They love to pray. Great. But the question is, why do they love to pray? Did they love to pray because they loved God? Did they love to pray because it ushered them into communion of his blessed presence? Why do they love to pray? They didn't love to pray for any good reason. They love to pray to be seen by men. The word see in Greek is the verb teomai, uh, from which we get theater in English and theatrical. They wanted to be on the show perform a play. They wanted to be on the stage. And in fact, the word hypocrites in Greek originally uh, refers to, to actor, actors in the ancient Greek. They were an actor in a theater. They were putting on something for everybody to see how holy they were. Now, that was the wrong motive. And dear friends, that was what Jesus wanted to deal with here and our, uh, the motive of our prayer. 
We may never unscramble all the mystery of prayer, but we can certainly deal with the issue of the motive as the Lord does here. Our prayers are not to be offered to men, but to God. Do we pray a prayer and while we are praying in some group, we are saying in our mind, boy, I bet uh, they thought that was a very good phrase that I used. Boy, I will bet that, uh, so and so, you know, I said what I wanted to say to so and so and they heard that what, what I wanted to say. Now they will, uh, now what I said will get him. Uh, whoever you are particularly trying to preach instead of praying. Or perhaps we thought, boy, you know, I'm coming along in my prayers. This one was one of my best that, that I ever prayed. We need to understand something about prayer. And need, we need to learn that. You know, prayer is not so sacred that Satan doesn't invade it. Don't think that when you pray, Satan runs away. No, that's in fact, you know, kind of a Islamic idea. They say if you name, uh, use the name of Allah, all the evil spirit will run away, which I don't think that's the case. You, in fact, may be inviting them. Uh, if I never learn anything more out of this text, you know what I learned? I learned that there is no holy ground, that Satan does not try to get into it. You would think that when I have my deepest devotion, and when I walk into the throne room of God, and when I commune with God in His holy presence, that I would not have sin on my heels? But I do. Sin will chase you to the throne room of God. You might as well know it. You know, I mean, it came from there in the beginning when Lucifer fell. And he will track you right back, sin of pride follows us into the very presence of God and it's so sad that it does but it's that's a reality in those quiet moments when we would enter his presence and worship him in purity we find ourselves being tempted to worship ourselves there is no sacred ground for Satan unfortunately he invades it all and I believe you know, in fact, in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, the two greatest times of attack from Satan that Jesus ever experienced in his life leading up to his death were one in the wilderness and another one in the Garden of Gethsemane. And at both times, what was he doing? Both times were, were times that he was in a solitary, isolated communion with Father. He was praying, and at the same time, those times where the, uh, he got the worst attack of Satan. It was there in that very private place of his communion with God, in prayer that Satan invaded with temptation as strong or stronger than any other times in his life. The lesson for us is don't think that because you have gone to the place of prayer, you have avoided the enemy. He will be there chasing your footstep. Sin defiles our deepest devotion and Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you may be praying, but your prayer have fallen to Satan's temptation. Now may I sum up these six faults and their prayers in uh, the statement that Jesus makes. Jesus condemns their prayer. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. They were praying self-centered prayers, self-centered prayers. And I guess pride is always the fatal flaw, and certainly it was in this case. Look at verse 5, and the whole passage will open to you now. The Lord says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the street that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their rewards. Do we understand now what it means? Notice the word when. Jesus says, when you pray, in verse 5. You see that in verse 6, when you pray. You see it in verse 7, when you pray. In other words, it is not if. The Lord is not saying if you pray, but when you pray. The Lord assumes that we pray. 
that's normal, natural to believe her as breathing is to any human being. It's not something that you have to ask believers to do it. It's something that they do because communing with the source of their life is a natural thing. It's a spiritual breathing. <clears throat> but when you pray, he says, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be phony. And there can be a lot of phonies in, the pr in prayer, a lot of it. Whether it's a public or private, it can be phony, short or long. It can be insincere, less than genuine. The issue is the heart issue. There was an old commentator, uh, he made this great statement. He said, the greatest danger to religion is that the old self, the flesh becomes religious. The greatest danger to religion is that the old self becomes religious. It can be the phony that masks the evil heart. Now, what is a self-centered prayer? Look at it. Don't pray as the hypocrites, the actors on the stage, for they love to pray. They are not just talking, uh, they are not just uh, taking a quiet place like the tax collector in Luke chapter 18, over in a corner, afar off, bent over, not lifting their head. No, they want to be seen by people. No. Please notice, stand, uh, standing and praying is not the issue. That's not the issue here. Because the standing was a normal Jewish posture for prayer. They, you know, they pray kneeling, they pray standing, you know, and standing was very common for prayer. That is not the issue. They loved to pray standing, and they would be very, that would be very, very normal. No one would think anything of that if they were standing. Something the sin here is that they love to pray standing in a synagogue. Again, no, that's not the issue. That's not the problem either. Because the synagogue was a place where lots of people stood and prayed. There is nothing wrong with a public prayer, nothing at all. It was a much uh, a matter of, these, are, these were all a part of the Jewish life, uh, praying uh, a part of the Jewish life. The problem was not a standing or sitting or being in a synagogue or not being in a synagogue. The problem was the heart problem. Others say, well, well, uh, if the problem was that they do it in the corners of the street. Again, no, no, that wasn't the issue either. That's not really a major issue either because if you happen to be going down the street and it was a time to pray, you prayed wherever you are. So that was very normal. Normal Jews would be praying all over the place. If they couldn't all make it to the temple at the third or sixth or the ninth hour, if they couldn't get to the synagogue at the right time, if they were outside their home and if they were in the street, well, that, that's fine. It's fine to pray. They would pray wherever they were. And they could pray standing, they could pray very silently, not even being noticed, just simply bind, uh, bind, bind they, their head. Uh, and in quietness of the moment, they would offer their prayer. They could say their prayer and no one would know it. Uh, that would be very normal course of life. That's not the issue either. However, there's a little hint here that something, something wrong because the Lord changes the word for the street. Back in verse 2, when he's talking about giving, when he talked about the giving, uh, to the poor in the street, he used the word narrow street. Now he uses the word for wide street in Greek. Uh, now that's a hint of something that he doesn't just say in the street. He says in what? In the corner of the wide street. He says when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who pray standing in a synagogue and in the wide possible intersection. Now I hope we are getting the picture. Again, I want to emphasize, there wouldn't be anything wrong in praying in a synagogue standing or even praying in a wide intersection. If it happened to be, if you happen to be there 
and it's time to prayer and you want to offer your prayer there wouldn't be anything wrong with praying at any place you could pray in the middle of an intersection you could pray anywhere you want it it wouldn't matter that's not the issue what is the issue it's a heart issue the issue the issue is in order they would do that in order that they may be what be seen by men everything else up to this up to that point could have been all right you get a little hint that something isn't right when you get them in the main intersection doing it but the point is that they did it to be seen by man even praying in the middle of the crowded intersection by itself there's nothing wrong with it it's the issue of the heart that am I talking to God or am I talking to man Do I want God to hear my prayer or I want men to see me pray and what our Lord is dealing with this here is that in your prayers make sure you are communing with God not performing an act for men see that's the point self-centered prayer uh, to call attention to me has no place in our lives has no place in our faith the scripture does not condemn public prayer it only condemns self-centered prayer and you can pray a self-centered prayer whether you're in public or whether in your private it can be in a long prayer or in a short prayer it's the attitude of our heart that's the point now they did it to be seen by men now again for example in the Old Testament in 2nd Chronicle chapter 6 you have a beautiful public prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9 a beautiful public prayer prayer in Acts chapter 4 the church met together for prayer they prayed publicly they prayed in the synagogue our Lord prayed private prayers to God in the presence of the 12 it tells uh, you can read that in Luke 11 that's not abnormal that there's nothing wrong it's the question is the attitude of our heart and he says at the end of verse 5 what they have their reward uh, what do we mean by that that they have their reward well they wanted to pray before man they wanted to get praise of men they and they got it and that's it they got their reward now God owes them nothing nothing self-centered prayer and they are rewarded in full with human impulses but then from the false way to true way you find it in verse 6 how do you not to pray self-centered prayer verse 6 but you when you pray go into your room uh, enter to your room and the Greek word here is the bed chamber or a closet in fact if that word is used of the place where you kept your treasures the most private place where you wouldn't want to bring anyone for the fear that they might take something or they know what you possess the most private place you have and when you have shut the door make it as private as possible then pray to your father who is in secret he who sees in secret will reward you do you want to be rewarded by God or by men do you really want men to hear your prayer or do you want God to hear because if you want men to hear your prayer God doesn't hear it and if you are to be rewarded from God then you uh, are lost in the secrecy of a communion with God and he who is in secret and he who sees the secret of your heart binds himself to, uh, together with you and no matter if the whole world is listening or not listening there is an intimacy in that communion that is not affected and that prayer is not self-centered now again he's not saying don't ever pray uh, anywhere until you are in a locked closet he's not saying that he's not saying that you must be in a locked closet in order to pray that's not what he's saying the closet could be the street a closet can be in fact a, a, a middle of a very crowded intersection depending on the attitude of your heart if you are unpretentious 
and silent and you're not trying to attract people to yourself. On the other hand, there are some people who pray in their secret. You know, it's interesting. Chrysostom, who was one of the church fathers, says that they pray in the secret, but they pray so loud that everybody down the hall and down the street will hear their praying in the secret. The idea is the heart attitude. Daniel prayed with his windows open, but he talked to God, not to men. Jesus said that uh, said the temple was the house of prayer, and masses of people would come there, but they were to talk to God, not to each other. In fact, Jesus even said, when you pray, pray our Father, and our is in a plural pronoun that demands a, you know, there is a group of people, a mass of people praying. There is nothing wrong with community praying, as long as the heart is pure, the heart is have a right attitude. So, at the end, what is God is asking us? He wants us to pray. Our job is to be obedient. Uh, ours is not trying to figure out the whole mystery of prayer. What is Jesus saying? He's saying when you pray, first of all, pray with a devout heart, a devout heart, a pure motive, seeking only the glory of God. You want to talk to God. A humble heart, secondly, a humble heart, seeking only attention of God, not men. And thirdly, confident heart. No full will that God knows all that you need. Come to him like a child with the simplicity of a childlike faith. And he waits for you. And he wants to hear from you. And he wants to show his glory in your life and in our prayer. So the final sentence is this. We must pray. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity um, of the, studying your word, the challenge that the Lord Jesus puts behind before us to search our heart when we pray. And may our prayer be only toward you, out of our love for you, out of the love that we want to have intimate communion with you, and we seek your glory. We need your wisdom, we need your power, we need your strength. And Lord, guide and lead us in our prayer. Help us to focus on you because we know from the example and the experience of our Lord how, in fact, at the very hour of prayer comes the, the intense attack of the enemy. But help us not to be discouraged and pray and always pray. Everywhere, Lord, but with a pure heart. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all turn to uh, 790 and uh, stand to sing? 790. <laughs> teach me to.
Heavenly Father, I pray you would teach us to pray, to take to heart the words uh, Rob taught us from your word. Um, and uh, we would pray and live for you through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Good day. Thank you.